Okay. Um, so yeah, the talk is styled titled An Introduction to Ripple Cluster Policies. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about in a nutshell. So generic speaker introduction, talk about what cluster policies are, um, what policy functions are available within Airflow, see some use cases, how to define your policy functions. So hi, my name is Philip, and I will be your speaker this afternoon. Um, I currently work as a solutions architect at Astronomer. Um, previously, I worked in data analysis and data engineering in the financial sector with small and large institutions. I am a big Python fan, a big Airflow fan, and this is AI Mini this. So today we're going to talk about cluster policies. Um, so what are cluster policies? Uh, cluster policies are a set of functions in Airflow that administrators can use to define logic on a few central Airflow concepts. So they can either mutate their flow objects or skip or deny a bag from being added to your backpack. And why is this useful? Um, this allows a cluster administrator to centrally, ma centrally manage how Airflow users or DAG writers are interacting with the Airflow cluster and modify or restrict their capabilities depending on either organizational policy or simply to ensure that multiple users uh, conform to common standards and generally play well together. For instance, you wouldn't want a single user to write a task that uses like 95% of the compute resources that are available to your for instance, causing other users' tasks to fail. That tends to be a problem in a production setting. Um, this is not a feature of Airflow that I see used very often, but I think it can be tremendously useful in a lot of occasions, and hopefully you consider using them in your cluster after this presentation. So what policy functions are currently implemented in Airflow? Um, we currently have tag policies, task policies, task instance mutation hooks, which is a bit of a mouthful and might trip off spelling it, sorry in advance. Um, pod mutation hooks and get airflow context bars, which I will talk about in this presentation. At the really high level, this is what the policy mechanism looks like. Um, so first we're going to go over a quick recap of some core Airflow concepts, and after that we'll see where that policy concepts, uh, I mean Airflow policy concepts apply to them. So at the basic level, there's two major concerns in Airflow. So that's writing a DAG, which we'll refer to as the DAG definition, and running a DAG, which we'll refer to as DAG instantiation. DAG policies can be applied to structure both these concerns. So first, when you write your DAG, you define DAG-level parameters, such as your schedule, its ID, should it catch up, if it has callbacks, DAG policy applies at this stage. Then you define your tasks, which are essentially a string of operators that you instantiate with arguments to parameterize your actual workloads. Um, task policy applies at this stage. Then your workloads actually have to run, which technically happens by Airflow instantiating an object known as a DAG run which is the representation of a singular run of your DAG. DAG runs contain task instances, which is an instance of a task, which sounds silly to mention, but there's actually a subtle distinction here because code-wise, a task instance is a separate class, not an instance of a task class, because the task class does not exist. Um, a task is an instance of an operator. Anyway, uh, the point is that task instance mutation hook applies to task instances. Finally, there's a special case, which is the pod mutation hook, um, this one applies to all Kubernetes pods created by your Airflow cluster, so whether that's true Kubernetes pod operator or QSI. So we'll look at these policies in more detail. So first, let's talk about DAG policy. DAG policy is a policy function that runs on all DAG objects after they're loaded in the DAG bag. It can either mutate, skip, or deny a DAG from being added to the DAG bag. It runs after your DAG has been fully generated, However, it's applied before task policy, which can have some implications for your overall policy system design. This also means that the DAG processor parses all DAG files, even if skipped or denied by the policy function. On the right side, you can see like a ballpark representation of what happens when the Airflow scheduler picks up your DAG file for parsing all the way to policy application. So the, back, the DAG file processor instantiates the DAG bag. Then the DAG bag collects the DAG objects and Python files and them. 
and that policy is applied as part of the private back back network. The next policy we'll look at is the task policy. Similarly to the DAG policy, it mutates tasks after they've been added to a DAG, and it can also skip or deny a DAG to which it's attached from being added to that DAG. Um, the function receives a base operator as an argument and can mutate it. Um, it cannot, and yeah, can also cause the DAG to be skipped or denied. So what happens in this case is, you know, same process essentially that um, we've seen for the DAG policy. Um, the DAG file processor instantiates the DAG bag, then the DAG bag collects the DAG objects and bags them. Then in the same private DAG bag method, we move over all tasks in the DAG currently being parsed and apply the task policy function in all elements. Now we turn to policy functions that are applied when executing workloads. Um, the first one we'll look at is the task instance mutation hook. Um, the task instance mutation hook is similar to the task policy function, but applies to task instances instead of an operator object. The main method between these two functions is that while task policies mutate the definition of a task, the task instance mutation hook applies policies to the instance of a task as part of the DAG bag. Um, the task instance mutation hook is called as part of the create TI method of the task creator of a DAG run, um, which is called by the verify integrity method of a DAG run, which is probably one of the more complex code paths in there, for in my opinion, um, if you want to read it. Anyway, however, uh, this method is only applied if task instance mutation hook actually exists, because um, the task instance mutation hook prevents an optimization in the flow that essentially creates task instances involved, and that's um, essential for performance, essentially. Finally, the last policy function that we'll mention is the pod mutation hook. Um, the pod mutation hook is the original policy function, which was introduced back in the Airflow1.x days um, when CubeXF was introduced. Well, after CubeXF was introduced. Uh, so back then, CubeXF was a very new concept, and it didn't offer as much configurability as it does today. So a pod mutation hook was introduced to provide an additional level of control over the workload environment for air tasks and cluster resources. Um, it takes a pod object as an argument and mutates it, and it applies to both pod objects generated by QPod operator and QExec method. When running on a pod scheduled by QPod operator, it's called when the pod object is constructed in the build pod request object method, which is called by the execute method of the operator. When running on the pod scheduled by QExec, it's called by the construct pod method of the pod generator object, which is called as part of the scheduling loop in the run next method. Okay, so like this sounds interesting in concept, but how do we define policy functions? Well, there's two ways. So either via Airflow local settings, which is the traditional method, or via plug -E, which is a newer method, essentially. Uh, applying policies using Airflow local settings is the easy to get started with method. Um, you basically create a module called Airflow, called Airflow local settings and ensure it's had to suspect. An easy way to do that is just by dropping it in your Airflow config directory. Um, the module should contain functions that match the exact signature of one or more of the policy functions defined in Airflow that you want to implement. So that's that policy, task policy, task instance mutation hook, pod mutation hook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the right, like we have an example of you know, policy functions that do nothing, but still that's how you define it. Since Airflow 2.6, a new policy configuration mechanism exists, um, it's actually just lost its experimental status a few days ago, and it's now considered part of the stable API. This actually replaces the previous configuration mechanism, which was based on Airflow local settings, but it also introduces the compatibility layer to preserve all the policy functions defined with the traditional method, so it's still valid. Um, Plug is basically a wrapper around the setup tools entry point mechanism um, that's sort of standard in Python. Um, it's a mechanism for installed packages to advertise, com advertise components it provides to be discovered and used by other pieces of code. Um, it provides for, plug well, provides for a specification which is, are defined using the hook spec decorator on a callable and implementations which are defined by the hook IMPL decorator on a callable. Um, this is how you would implement a policy plugin using the plugin interface. So on the left, we, on the left, we have a task policy plugin implementation. Again, it does nothing, but that's not the point. Um, 
And on the right, we have a pyproject.toml file, which defines the metadata required for the policy plugin to hook into Airflow. Um, the important part is highlighted in yellow, and it's the entry points definition. Um, in this case, it needs to use the airflow.policy group. Sorry, is that too small? Okay. Um, this method is a lot more complex than using the airflow local settings.py right, file, but um, it's most helpful for administrators who need to centrally distribute plugins, uh, policy plugins to multiple airflow instances. Okay, so now um, we know too much about how policy functions work, and we know how to define them, so let's take a look at some examples. Um, we'll see some popular, popular use cases, so that's how to ensure that the DAG is tagged properly, how to ensure that DAGs in development do not run in production, how to enforce task timeout, how to enforce resource requests and limits and tasks, and also some funkier examples, such as how to replace an operator with its deferrable counterpart automatically, um, how to use a different environment um, for different operators, and how to retry a task. How to retry a task on a different queue on Celery. So first, ensuring DAGs are tagged. This is like the canonical example for policies altogether. Um, often enough, a cluster administrator will want to ensure that the person or team responsible for a DAG is appropriately identified on the for instance. And this is an example of how to do that. Um, so tags are strings. In this case, we expect a key value format where the key is owner and the value is freeform. Uh, we use a list comprehension to retrieve a list of keys from the tags on the tag by splitting them on the column character. Um, then if the owner string is not found in the keys, we raise an therefore cluster policy violation exception, which is the mechanism to deny a tag its addition to the tag value via policy. And this raises a visible import error in the Airflow UI. Um, let me see. Yeah. Second example is ensuring DAGs in development do not run in production. Um, this is a policy meant to prevent mistakes, essentially. So the context here is that a lot of Airflow setups use different instances for production, development, testing, etc. cetera, um, environments. Um, with connections pointing to dev or prod instances of external data services from the respective Airflow instance. So code promotion across those environments can be a difficult challenge and errors such as you know, promoting a DAG whose workload isn't quite ready yet to production by mistake can happen. To prevent this from happening, we can define like sort of a safeguard with a policy that once again checks the tags on a DAG. If a DAG is not tagged with, in this case, maturity call in production, we raise an airflow cluster policy skip DAG exception, which is the built-in exception that causes a DAG to be skipped without raising a scary report error. Next example is enforcing a task timeout. So this is also a canonical policy example. Um, in many contexts, it can be beneficial to limit the time that the task can execute for um, task slots are a finite resource in a cluster, and um, an airflow cluster, and on, in the case, in case you have an airflow cluster shared across many teams or many individuals, you often want to limit the amount of resources that individual workloads consume, um, so as to leave capacity for others. In this case, we want to limit the task to run no more than 24 hours. Um, we use a task policy for this purpose. So we define a min timeout value and check that first off, our tasks have an execution timeout set. And second off, the value, second off, the value of the timeout is no greater than minimum timeout, which is set to 24 hours in this case. If any of these conditions are true, we deny the DAG with an airflow cluster policy violation exception. I apologize, this is probably the worst slide that I've made. Um, setting resources and limits on a task. So similar to the previous example, in an Airflow cluster utilizing Kubernetes executor, we might want to limit the amount of resources that the task is able to consume so as to leave capacity available for other users. Um, for instance, you would usually not want a task that uses 128 bytes of memory on your queue cluster if your nodes have 128 gigs of memory available in total, for instance. In order to do that, we can mutate the task and pass in a pod override through the executor config task parameter in the task policy. 
And what happens in this case is that it's readable, but the value will be updated to the policy functions as seen, as seen, as seen above. Now onto the funkier examples. Let's say that your users heavily use Snowflake Operator using a lot of tasks, slots on your Apple cluster. Um, you also know that Astronomer has released a deferrable counterpart to Snowflake Operator named Snowflake Operator Sync, which is available in its provider package. And you would like your users to use that instead of the, to use that instead because the deferrable operator releases its task slot while it's waiting for a query from Snowflake. So in this case, you could sort of help them with the bank policy. Um, tasks in the DAG are stored in a dictionary called task dict in the DAG itself. You can loop over it and check if the task is an instance of Snowflake Operator. If it is, you can instantiate the Snowflake Operator as sync with arguments from the Snowflake Operator's parameters and just swap it out. I'm not saying this is a good practice, but it's possible. Um, and then finally, a use case that we see often in my day-to-day -day work is users would like to use different environments for different tasks without having to rely on Kubernetes pod operator. So QPod operator is really great, but it's also kind of a crude tool, and a lot of users, of users would rather be able to benefit from the built-in operator interface native to Airflow instead of having to use a custom image to run the workloads. With that being said, keeping track of different Airflow images is a cumbersome burden for users. So a cluster administrator could take this off their hands, essentially, and override the default Airflow worker image in a cube, or in a cube exec context, depending on which operator is being used by a task. This example illustrates how to achieve this with the Spark Summit operator, which is a good candidate, actually, for this, because um, using, it re using it requires the Spark dependencies to be installed in the worker image, and this often causes image layer sizes to be removed, unfortunately. Um, on Celery, you could do something similar with work queues. Um, so yeah, essentially in this case, we check if um, the task that is passed to task policy is an instance of Spark Summit operator. And if it is, essentially we override the image for the base container with, in this case, Airflow with Spark. Then afterwards, we take that executor config and pass it and replace the tasks to get different config parameter with this one. And um, also there's something else that I'd like to highlight here, and it's that this task also mutates the doc property to provide a warning to users indicating that the task has been mutated. And um, I think this is important and especially good practice because with complex mutations, it can be difficult for users to reason about what's actually happening to their task because when the tasks don't do exactly what their tasks are specified, it's just weird. So yeah, I feel that's just polite practice. And final example, in my opinion, which isn't really that interesting, but I wanted to highlight the use case for the task instance mutation hook. Um, very often when tasks tend to fail, it's because of resource contention on the end of the worker. And that's especially frustrate, frustrating for DAG writers because they often enough don't have access to the cluster's underlying infrastructure which makes debugging, debugging the issue complex and introduces a fix, and introducing a fix is often even harder. What if we wanted to mitigate this for our users? This example assumes that we are running on an Airflow installation that, le le that leverages the seller executor, um, and the seller executor has a concept of queues. Workers can be configured to listen to one or multiple specific queues, and you can specify a queue on which a task should run by indicating it with an argument to your task init method. Argument is just queue. Um, the seller executor will then submit these tasks to, to the specified queue, which you can use to provide a different set of capabilities for different tasks. In this case, we've configured a worker that runs a machine with more resources that listens for tasks in a queue called big machine. And we've configured the task instance mutation hook to submit tasks to this, to this queue when they enter the third product. Preferred refract. That's relatively unsophisticated, but it could be too. Um, so yeah, earlier in my slides I promised the bug report about map tasks, and there's a special case with map operator actually. So when you mutate tasks, you may run into a problem because most properties of map operator are not mutable. Um, this isn't generally a problem for deny slash skip policies, but it is for mutations. Um, fortunately, there is a workaround. You can get past this with a partial, partial capable URL parameter 
which is mutable. This, in effect, mimics what happens when you call um, the expand method on the part. Still, we should probably introduce a better interface. Um, takeaways, their flow policy functions are powerful, where yet relatively unknown feature available to prepare for cluster administrators. They are essential to a cluster administrator's toolbox to ensure that their flow instances are governed properly. You should use them, but also remember that with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so yeah, try not to surprise your users with unobvious or undocumented mutations. Um, for instance, you can mutate a task for a tax docmd or task instances notes to give some feedback to your users as to what your policies really need to prevent. Finally, an astute listener may have noticed that I didn't give any example using the pod mutation book, um, but we have looked at examples that mutate pods. So the question is, do we still need pod mutation book in 2023? Um, and I think the answer is maybe, in the sense that it does give you an interface that applies to all pods that your cluster um, to all pods that your cluster would instantiate, whether they come from Git or Cubic But there is a way to basically do everything it does just using task interfaces. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Phil. Great stuff. Do we have any questions? Okay. Right. So, astronomer seem it, when you look at the astronomer documentation, it actually says you can't use the Airflow local settings file approach. You cannot use the Airflow local settings approach on Astro, but you can use the plugin mechanism. Is there a plan to move astronomer to using the plugin mechanism? Well. You can already use it, like it's part of Airflow. So as long as you're using Airflow 2.6, you can essentially just install a package in your environment that would have a module um, that's essentially pointed to by your um, metadata, entry point metadata in, in your package, and Airflow would pick it up. So it is possible to use it in Astro as well. If you go back to your example, uh, what it, if you go back to your example where you uh, check the maturity production tags. Yeah. So this cluster policy would run both on dev and production, right? How do you ensure that cluster policies are different for dev and production? That's a very good question. You could deploy different packages on your production or development instances, or you could simply define different Airflow local settings file on, on both, essentially. but Yes, um, if you don't have a mechanism to basically deploy different packages or different codes essentially on, on those instances, it's, it's something you'd have to do with externally, essentially. Yeah. Thank you.